These. Dialogue 6 and 7. Taken from Spectacle de la Nature. Or. Nature Displayed. Being discourses on such particulars of natural history. As were thought most proper. To excite the curiosity. And. Form the minds of youth. These. Dialogue 6. The Count, and Countess. The Prior, and. The Chevalier. Countess. We have at last disengaged ourselves, sir, from the company who interrupted our conversations, and the prior has sent to acquaint us, he will be here immediately. In the meantime, may we know what your conversation turned upon yesterday. Chevalier? Instead of entertaining me with a long discourse, on the various conditions and employments of wasps, the prior brought me an entire nest of those creatures, he showed me an enclosure filled with several ranks of stories, and a number of apartments, some quite open, in which there was only one egg, or a living worm, others were closed up, and lodged the nymphs that were ready to become perfect wasps. Others had their doors begun to be broken down, out of which I saw a beautiful wasp issue, as I was carrying the nest, the prior presented me with, to my chamber. I intend to have a box made on purpose to preserve it. Count. Take care, however to expose it, for some days, in the warmest sunshine, or even at the fire, to destroy the insects that may still be living there. I need not give you a reason for this precaution. As to the rest, I am very glad you have an idea of the labors of a wasp, since it will make you more easily comprehend our account of bees. Chevalier? I see the prior coming up to our arbor. What does he carry under his arm? I fancy you'll find it to be another present for me. Countess? He certainly brings you some new essay, capable of ocular demonstration. Tis no less than an honeycomb. Chevalier? That is what I have never seen. It is a happy thing to have to do with the prior, for one immediately finds every wish gratified. Prior. I had no occasion, sir, to go very far for what I have brought, it was all at my own house. Count. Let us be seated then, our conversation must now turn on a very important subject, we are going to engage in politics, and the government of states. Prior. Our discourse must be a little diversified, and set off with an air of dignity. I yesterday entertained the Chevalier with nothing but robberies and murders, but we will talk today of public welfare, colonies, economy, policy, and application to labor, for all these make up the distinguishing character of the nation of bees. Whatever can be said, on the subject of these creatures, may be reduced to two classes, one comprehends the particulars which are obvious to all the world, and familiar to the peasants themselves, for which reason I shall not put the count to the trouble of giving us a detail of these. The other contains points of much greater curiosity, which cannot be known without the aid of a glass hive, and philosophic eyes. His lordship, who is very well provided with both, will take upon him the province of instructing us. Chevalier? Is it true, sir, that the bees have a king? Prior. You may certainly distinguish three sorts of bees in a hive. The first are the common species, who make up the populace, are charged with all the work, and seem to be neither male nor female. They are all furnished with a trunk for their labors, and a sting for their defense. The second sort are the drones, who are of a more dusky complexion, and bigger than the bees by one-third, though some indeed have been found of the same size with these. The drones have been thought to be the males, and beside this, they have no sting. Above an hundred of this species have been found in a little hive of seven or eight thousand bees, but the number is three or four times as great, in a large hive of seventeen or eighteen thousand. There is likewise a third sort, much more vigorous and long than the drones themselves and who are armed with a sting like the generality of bees. It is thought there is but one of these in each hive, or at least but one in every swarm or colony of young bees, who, from time to time, are detached from the hive, and go to fix themselves in another situation. Whether we ought, with the Antients, to call this large be the king, or, with the moderns, give it the title of queen, I leave the count to determine. Count. By the assistance of a glass hive, I ordered to be made for my use, I have observed, very distinctly, the three classes of bees the prior has been describing, and have frequently seen the large bee, who is dignified with the title of king, marching from chamber to chamber. There was nothing at the bottom of the cell, 
before the infect sheathed the extremity of its body in the cavity, but, when it retired, I observed an egg left behind, from whence it is natural to conclude this bee to be female. And as I have often taken notice, that, in a whole swarm, there was generally but one of this species, who indeed is very remarkable, though there are sometimes two, but never more than three, I thought it more proper to call her the queen. However, I would not disagree with anyone who entertains a different opinion. But what are the prior's sentiments about those large bees they call drones? They are not foreigners, because I have seen them born in cells prepared for their reception, and which are larger than the others. What then is their province? Shall we assign them to the queen, as her consorts? My hive has not, as yet, furnished me with discoveries on that point, that are altogether satisfactory. Prior. All that I know, my lord, of drones, is this, they have a bag of honey in their bellies, like other bees, with this difference, that the bees have their bag continued by a little canal to their neck, by means of which they discharge the honey into the general magazines. And when you press a bee never so lightly, the honey immediately evacuates through this passage, which is not the case with the drone. That creature eats, and retains all for its own benefit, and contributes nothing to the common stock. It lives in plenty, and never works, or wanders in the fields, but at the most, only takes the air, and walks in full liberty round the hive, it has no sting, and the reason why nature did not arm it with one, is evident, it has no enemy to fear. As to the rest, I cannot persuade myself, that a nation so remarkable for economy, would permit such indolent companions to dwell among them, unless they were necessary in some particular. Some have suspected that their province is to supply the queen with issue, or, in other terms, to people the state with subjects. Count. There is something more to be observed, by the anatomy that has been made of them, some have thought they have discovered in their structure, that they were the authors of generation. I have endeavoured all I could to observe in my transparent hive, what character the drones maintained with respect to the queen, and this is all the discovery I was capable of making. The queen keeps herself retired in the upper apartments of the comb, and which, if you please, we will call her palace. She very seldom appears in public, and whenever she shows herself, you will always see her march with a sedate, and majestic air. You smile, chevalier, but the matter is quite otherwise. She never walks alone, and if she is not attended by the whole swarm, she is, at least, followed by several large bees, who are probably the drones that form her court. As the sovereign takes her walks but very rarely, and as these apparently tend to the general welfare, whenever they happen, a great festival is celebrated through all the dominions, the whole nation comes abroad, and every subject is all transport, and, in order to give her a solemn reception, the bees hang upon one another with their paws, and, in less than a moment, from a large veil, behind form anything that passes. This veil, if you please, shall be a suit of tapestry, hung in honour to the Queen's progress, or else a curtain drawn by the domestics before her. Prior. Your Lordship ascribes to them very noble, or, at least, very modest intentions. Chevalier? Is not this ceremony, a dance occasioned by the festival? Countess? A dance? For my part one don't know, but I'm sure it is the last thing the prior would admit, for he is not very favourable to that diversion. Count. As to the rest, whatever may be the intention of these creatures, in hanging thus together by their paws, and forming themselves into a chorus at the approach of the sovereign, the fact is incontestable, and I have afterwards observed, that the queen proceeded from chamber to chamber, and, in each of them, deposited an egg, after she had privately examined whether each apartment was empty, and whilst the sunk the extremity of her body into any cell, the drones of her court ranged themselves, in a circle around her, and, turning their faces to the queen, fluttered their wings, and seemed to celebrate the nativity of this new progeny. She peoples ten, twelve, and sometimes more cells at each fecundation, and is, herself, prolific enough to give birth to fix or seven thousand young, in the space of twelve months, she can see her children's children, by the instrumentality of two or three other bees like herself, and is, in one summer, the ancestor of eighteen thousand descendants. Prior. What seems to complete the proof that these drones are so many stallions, destined only to multiply their species, is this, they are liberally provided for, the whole summer, 
but when the queens have discharged their swarms, and, at the approach of autumn, it begins to be foreseen, that there will neither be time nor warmth sufficient to rear a new family, then the drones are persecuted and expelled, since they are found to be chargeable to the community, where they only consume the provisions. The bees no longer allow them to continue in the hive. Their aversion extends even to the young drones, they eject them from their cells, and first kill, and then cast them out of the hive, and after this pursue their fathers. Tis to no purpose for them to be desirous of staying there, the bees seize them by the wings and shoulders, they jostle and fatigue them, and, without the least remorse, banish every individual, except perhaps a very few, and even those of a less rapacious species, whose expenses are a little more supportable. These are reserved for the necessities of the ensuing year, which I the rather remark, because the queen renews her pregnancy in the spring, though one sometimes sees among them only those drones, who, in their shape and dimensions, differ very little from common bees. Chevalier? And what becomes of these poor drones? They give me a great deal of concern. Prior. Rains, birds, and famine, are their destruction, and the ground near the hive is covered with their carcasses. Countess? I find the husbands make no very agreeable figure in this country. Count. The maxim is, that the general welfare should be the first law of the state. Prior. The bees don't think themselves under any obligation to support the idle, who, in one season of the year, would consume all the labor, of the other, and especially at a time when the bees themselves can find nothing more to subsist on, and so, chevalier, if the drones are constrained to be their own caterers, it is owing not only to economy, but necessity itself. Chevalier? You are very unwilling, sir, that one should entertain an ill opinion of your favorite bees, and it is evident you are very fond of this insect. Prior. I confess they furnish me with a profitable revenue, and I have known some years wherein my bees brought me in more than my benefice. Countess? That is not the reason why they are favored with your compliance, you are warm in espousing their interest, because they faithfully observe the moral you inculcate, that those who will not work should not eat. Prior. That may very well be, but all complaisance and interest a part, tis impossible to give even a small attention to the manners and maxims of this little people, without finding them perfectly amiable in their conduct as well as their industry. Chevalier? Their manners, I confess, charm me, but their labors deserve a little consideration, and that is the point I would willingly come to. Prior. Before I entertain you upon this head, it will be necessary to let you see their implements. The Count, who has had surveyed them with his microscopes more accurately than myself, will not be satisfied with anything I can advance. Count. I willingly undertake their description, but don't pretend to give you a complete analysis of a bee's body, it will be sufficient, my dear Chevalier, to take notice of the principal parts with which nature has supplied them, and the use to which they are devoted. The body of a bee is divided, by two ligaments, into three parts or portions, the head, the breast and the belly. The head is armed with two jaws, and a trunk, the former of these play like saws, opening and shutting to the right and left, these saws serve them instead of hands, to hold and knead their wax, and to throw away whatever incommodes them. The trunk is a, but I shall do better to imitate the prior, and address myself to your eyes, since I have an opportunity of so doing. I have here a couple of these trunks, glued upon two slips of paper. Look upon them, one after another, in the microscope. Prior. They could not be more advantageously placed to make one distinguished by means of the other. Perhaps the chevalier may think these two figures are the same, or two trunks that have a perfect similitude to each other. Chevalier? I see one is twice as long as the other, that which is the longest, is thick at one end, and tapers to the other extremity, it has likewise a small bending towards the middle, and, at the bottom, is wound about by four branches that are hollow within, like a reed cut into four parts. I don't comprehend all this? Count. What you say is, however, very just. Have a little patience, and observe the other. Chevalier? The other is still thicker, very short, and without the four branches. Count. Are you sure of that? Chevalier? Stay, my lord, if you please, I think I begin to discover them more exactly, this second trunk must needs be sheathed, and the branches perform the office of a scabbard. 
The first trunk is unfolded for work, and the second wrapped up in the peaceful enjoyment of its acquisitions. This evidently justifies what the prior told me last, that the minutest things in nature were appointed to some peculiar end and purpose, and that the deity is as conspicuous in the structure of a fly's paw, as he is in the bright globe of the sun himself. Prior. You must habituate yourself to comprehend that this appointment is certain, even in those things where it is not understood, because at every step you will find it, though the reason does not immediately appear, tis your part to inquire after it, and to admire and glorify God in the discovery. Show the trunk of a bee to whom you please, it may be said, it is but a fly's paw, to what use can it be appropriated? And yet this instrument is such, that a bee, with its assistance, can collect more honey in one day, than an hundred chemists could extract in an hundred years, and the wisdom of the Creator, that appears so evidently in the present he has made of this precious instrument to the bee, is not less apparent in the means with which he has furnished her for its preservation. For this trunk is long and taper, as well as pliant and flexible in the utmost degree, that the insect may be enabled to probe to the bottom of flowers, through all impediments of their foliage and chives, and drain them of their treasured sweets. But were this trunk always extended, it would prove incommodious, and be liable to be shattered by a thousand accidents, it is therefore composed of two pieces, connected by a kind of spring or joint, in such a manner, that after the performance of its necessary functions, it may be contracted, or rather folded up, and, beside this, it is fortified against all injuries, by four strong scales, two of which closely sheath it, and the two others, whose cavities and dimensions are larger, encompass the whole. Count. Let us now proceed to the rest of the body, the middle part, or breast of a bee, sustains the legs, which are fixed in number, together with the four wings, two greater and as many less, which serve not only to transport her where she pleases, but by the noise they make, to advertise the bees of their departure and arrival, and likewise to animate them mutually when they are at work. Here is a dead bee, let us take notice of the hair which covers her whole body, and assists her to retain the little grains of wax that fall from the top of the chives to the bottom of the flowers. In the next place observe, at the extremity of her paws, two little hooks, that the microscope will render visible, and exhibit to you in the form of two sickles rising out of the same handle, with their points opposite to each other. These hooked claws that are so serviceable to the bee in a thousand instances, are clapped over two balls of sponge, to render her ordinary march more easy, and agreeable. The belly of this infect is distinguished into fixed rings, which lengthen, and likewise contracts themselves, by sliding over one another. The inside of this region of the body consists of four parts, the intestines, the bag of honey, the bag of poison, and the sting. The office of the intestines is to digest the food, in the same manner this function is performed in all other animals. The bag of honey is as transparent as crystal, and contains the fluid sweets extracted from flowers by the bee, a small portion of which must remain in the bag to nourish the animal, but the largest quantity is discharged into the little cells of the magazine, to support the whole community in winter. The bag of poison or gall, hangs at the root of the sting, through the cavity of which, as through a pipe, the bee ejects foam, drops of this venomous liquor into the wound, and so renders the pain more excessive. The sting is composed of three parts, the sheath and two darts. The sheath tapers into a very fine point, near which is an opening, calculated to give a free passage to the gall. The two darts are launched through another aperture, and are planted with small sharp points, like the beards of a hook, and which rising a little obliquely, render the incision more afflictive, and create the bee a great deal of trouble to draw them out, and indeed the never disengages them, if the wounded party happens to start, and put her into confusion. But if one can have patience to continue calm and unmoved, she brings down these lateral points, and clinches them round the shaft of the dart, by which means she recovers her weapon, and gives less pain to the person stung. The scabbard is likewise finely pointed, and makes the first penetration, which is succeeded by the injection of the darts and poisonous liquor. This scabbard has very vigorous muscles, which contribute to its disengagement from the wound, but when it has been plunged too deep, these muscles are torn from the body of the bee, and remain with the sting. The liquor, which the at the same time infuses into the wound, causes a fermentation, attended with a swelling, which continues several days, but that may be prevented by immediately drawing out the sting, and enlarging the puncture, to give perspiration to the venomous matter. 
So much for the implements of bees. Let us now proceed to their labors, and particularly the structure of their cones. Chevalier, permit me, my lord, to ask the prior, what method they take to assemble all the bees in one hive. Prior, do but imagine to yourself, a tribe of these animals lodged either in the hollow of a tree, the cavity of a rock, or in a hive they have accidentally found. There they bring up their young, and when these are come to maturity, they raise another progeny. The whole society dwell peacefully together, as long as their habitation is sufficiently spacious and convenient, but when the numbers multiply to such a degree as renders them incapable of rearing a new generation, without incommoding themselves, then the old bees, in whom the rights and sovereignty of that republic are vetted, publish an edict, commanding all of such an age and under, to seek a new settlement, and evacuate the place at a certain time, threatening the disobedient with the utmost severity of their stings. I may perhaps be mistaken. In the style of the proclamation, since I have never seen it, but in reality, the refusal to retire at the time prescribed, draws a bloody war on the young swarm, however, the command is generally received with submission, and on some certain day, or rather at the same instant, all the young nation, with their queen in the van, abandon the hive, and expatiate through the country, in quest of a new habitation. This detachment may be properly called a real colony. The old bees always continue in possession of their ancient habitation. Chevalier? Methinks I am listening to the history of the Tyrians and Sidonians, who being straitened for want of room, and growing very numerous, dispatched colonies to Carthage and Cadiz, as well as many other places. But I interrupt the history of the bees. Prior. When our young offspring have taken the wing, they wander with a buzzing flight through the air, in search of a commodious retreat, and sometimes fix in a cluster upon the trunk of a tree, and sometimes on a branch. It may be supposed, that some of them are deputed to the office of scouts, and, when in pursuance of their commission, they have found either a spacious cavity in a wall, or the hollow of an old tree, or else a hive, which the country people who are always vigilant on those occasions, prepare for their accommodation, after they have rubbed it over with balm, thyme, and other odoriferous herbs, the queen, upon the representation made to her, or in consequence of her own observations, puts herself in motion. Upon which the whole cluster disengage themselves and follow their sovereign, who enters into the cavity presented to her, takes possession of the place, and there settles with all her people. Tis frequently the custom to ring a little bell, or tinkle a brass pan, to advertise them that a mansion is prepared for their reception. This sound makes an impression upon them, and composes their disorder, and perhaps they mistake it for a peal of thunder, likely to be succeeded by a dangerous storm. However, in the very instant either of the fear or tranquility that the sound inspires, they very attentively confide at the offered retreat. They are not displeased if you oblige them, by some gentle constraint, to enter into the hive, or perhaps their natural inclinations may determine them to choose a sanctuary there. When this is done, he that presented the hive to them, removes it very tenderly, and they suffer themselves to be carried off without any resentment. The hive is then placed upon a stand of level planks, closely riveted together, or upon a plat of earth crusted over with a superficies made of the duft of bricks or tiles, in order to exclude all insects and exhalations. A little opening is left at the bottom of the hive, after which they range themselves in the manner they are well acquainted with, what is afterwards transacted, falls more within the Count's province than mine. Count. When the labors of bees are under our examination, we may consider the materials they employ in building, the use to which that building is appropriated, and the manner wherein the whole is transacted. The materials are only glue and wax, which they collect from various flowers, the building is used as a commodious habitation for themselves and their offspring, and as to the manner of erecting it, let me inform you of some instances of their sagacity. I am unacquainted with the language spoken by the nation of bees, but that they have a language which they understand, and agree to use for the mutual communication of their thoughts, is a fact I take to be undeniable. When they begin to build the hive, they divide themselves into four bands, one of which is consigned to the fields, to collect materials for the structure, the second works upon these materials, and form them into a rough sketch of the dimensions and partitions of the cells. All this is polished and completed by the third band, who examine and adjust the angles, remove the superfluous wax, and give the work its necessary perfection. The fourth band bring provisions to the laborers, who cannot leave their work, 
but no distribution is made to those whose charge calls them to the fields, because it is supposed they will hardly forget themselves, neither is any allowance made to those who begin the architecture of the cells, and indeed their province is very troublesome, because they are obliged to level and extend, as well as cut and adjust the wax with their jaws, but then they soon obtain in a dismission from their labor, and retire to the fields to regale themselves with food, and wear off their fatigue with a more agreeable employment. Those who succeed them, draw their mouth, their paws, and the extremity of their body, several times over all the work, and never desist till the whole is polished and completed, and as they frequently need refreshments, and yet are not permitted to retire, there are waiters always attending, who serve them with provisions when they require them. Chevalier, have you seen this, my lord, count? Very perfectly. They express their meaning by signs. The laborer who has an appetite, bends down his trunk before the caterer, to intimate that he has an inclination to eat, upon which the other opens his bag of honey, and pours out a few drops, which I have distinctly seen rolling through the whole length of his trunk that grew sensibly swelled in every part through which the liquor flowed. When this little repast is over, the laborer returns to his work, and his body and paws repeat the same motion as before. Chevalier? Is it very long before the work is completed? Count. Though the elegance and proportions of it are admirable, yet the builders are so indefatigable, that a honeycomb composed of a double range of cells, backed one against another, and which is a foot long and six inches broad, is finished in one day, so as to be capable of receiving three thousand bees. Beside this, the symmetry of these combs is abundantly more complete than that of a wasp's nest, for the cells not only terminate at the bottom in a point, accommodated to receive the little egg, and can to the warmth which it would not enjoy in the same degree, were it deposited on a flat, but they are likewise composed of little triangular panels that regularly unite in a point, and exactly correspond with the like extremities of the opposite cell. Break a few of these little apartments, and you will find the fact to be as I have described, take notice also, that they shape and dispose their combs in a very different manner from the wafts, for whereas these infects build but one range of cells, and place them horizontally over one another, the bees make their cells double, or composed of two ranks of apartments, the extremities of which touch each other, and are perpendicularly suspended with an interval between each two. That affords the bees a passage sufficiently spacious, and, at the same time, contracted enough to promote all the warmth they can possible need. Chevalier? But, my lord, I find, at the entrance into all the lodges, a kind of ledge, which makes the opening of the door narrower than the dimensions within, whereas the passage into the wasp's cell is as wide as the apartment itself. Count. This is an otherwise precaution, for as the bees live seven or eight years, and more, and the wasps seldom survive one, in which circumstance the conduct of providence is very remarkable and calls for our gratitude, they fortify the aperture of their cells with this ledge, which being joined to that of the neighboring cells, makes the whole very difficult to be shattered, so that the work continues several years uninjured, notwithstanding the shocks occasioned by the frequent ingress and returns. As well as the repeated efforts of the mothers who come there to lay their eggs, and notwithstanding the motions of the laborers, who there deposit their wax and honey, and the struggles of the nymphs, who, when they become bees, make vigorous endeavors to disengage themselves from their confinement. Prior. These habitations, chevalier, differ very much from ours, which always decay with time whereas they grow stronger by duration, at least, to a certain period. Chevalier? How can that be? Prior. The foundations of our houses think with the earth they are built on, the walls begin to stoop by degrees, they nod with age, and bend from their perpendicular, lodges damage everything, and time is continually introducing some new decay. On the contrary the mansions of bees grow stronger, the oftener they change their inhabitants. Every worm, before its conversion into a nymph, fastens its skin to the partitions of its cell, but in such a manner as to make it correspond with the lines of the angles, and without the least prejudice to the regularity. In one summer the same lodging may serve three or four worms successively, and when that season returns, it can again accommodate the same number. Each worm never fails to fortify the panels of his chamber, by arraying them with his spoils, and the next apartment likewise receives the same augmentation. I have sometimes found seven or eight of these skins, spread over one another, 
so that all the cells being encrusted with fix or seven of these coverings, well dried and cemented with a strong glue, the whole fabric daily acquires a new degree of solidity. Chevalier? But I find an inconvenience in this, sir, for so many skins may happen to be glued over one another as to render the apartment too contracted in its dimensions. Prior. The difficulty you start is very reasonable, and I must refer you to the Count for a satisfactory answer. Count. Can you guess how the bees proceed in this case? They alter the property of these cells, and lodge their young where they formerly stored their honey, and at the same time deposit their honey where they once lodged their young, at least this is the opinion of some observers, though I shall not undertake to warrant it. As to the rest, you find the bees are skillful enough in their works, to induce you to believe they know when it is proper to clear away superfluities, and it must be confessed, that at the end of six or seven years, the cells become too contracted, and all the work grows ruinous. You have seen, my dear Chevalier, their expertness in architecture. We must now give you some insight into their economy, and direct your observation to what passes in the magazines of wax and honey. Their structure and use will be equally entertaining to you. They have first of all, the precaution too. Chevalier? Ah! My lord, all is at an end, I see five or six fox hunters, who are now alighting in the court, and the servants are going to take their horses into the stable. Countess? We need not break up in a hurry, those gentlemen must have their boots taken off, and notice will be given us when to wait on them. The prior has shown us the comb, and its contents, but has not given us a sight of what is wrapped up in that paper. Prior. You know, Chevalier, the cells where the young are lodged, you likewise have seen those which contain the wax, and I have here, in a sheet of white paper, a piece of the honeycomb. Chevalier? Must not summiting be done to the honey before it can be fit to eat? Prior. No, sir, it is here in all its purity, and infinitely better than when it has been degenerated by the hands of men, pray venture to taste a little, only throw the wax away. Chevalier? I never tasted anything more delicate, and am no longer surprised that the authors I have read, always mentions honey, when they would acquaint us with something agreeable. Prior. Honey was the sugar of the ancients, but we make very little use of it now, since we have had our modern sugar from the East and West Indies. Countess? In my opinion, Chevalier, you have pretty much of the ancient palate. Chevalier? Madam, I never knew, till this day what a honeycomb was. Countess? Be wise then in time? You see the prior is always the same, and gives a perpetual relish to everything he does. When he takes his leave of us, he will go and catechize in some little hut, where instead of honey, he will not fail to distribute his arms. Prior. I am very glad my behavior pleases your ladyship, I shall always continue to give instruction, and even part with as much honey as will be acceptable. But charity is your ladyship's province, and I am only your almoner. Count. These little animals, whom we behold so sociable in their community, are industrious to assist each other, and prevent their mutual necessities with a surprising generosity, and shall we leave our fellow creatures in distress. On the contrary, I am convinced, that the finest of all pleasures consists in preserving persons from calamity, and it is a pleasure capable of increasing in proportion to our ability to give. But let us wait on the company. The end of the sixth dialogue. Bees. Dialogue 7. The Count, and Countess. The Prior, and? The Chevalier. Chevalier? Gentlemen, I desire you to remember we are this day to visit the two great manufactures of wax and honey. Prior has taken a particular view of both, and I should be glad to know first of all, what this wax is. Prior. The bees have two sorts one gross and indifferent, the other much finer. The first is blackish, and pretty much resembles glue, or a very thick pitch. The other kind of wax is a natural fat, or a vegetable oil, finely scented and thick. This the bees find around these innumerable little grains that are visible on the chives which rife from the bottom of flowers, and is a composition of bitter juices they extract from certain plants, straw, rotten wood, and impaired or acid liquors. Chevalier? Wherein is this glue useful? Prior. I'll inform you. When they have found a hive, or some other commodious habitation, their first employment is, to close up very exactly, with this glue, 
all the fissures and crannies, and strengthen the weak places, so that the winds can have no admission, and the insects, who would otherwise make depredations on the glue, are prevented by their insupportable aversion to the bitter flavor. Count. Upon this occasion I will relate an event I beheld myself. A few days since, a snail, took it into his head to steal into the glass hive in my window. There was no entrance to pass, throw but the proper one, and in the animal went. The porters received him very rudely at the gate, and the first attacks they made upon him with their stings, obliged him to march with more expedition, but the stupid creature, instead of retreating, thought to save himself by going forwards, and he advanced into the very middle of the hive, upon which a whole troop of bees fattened upon him at once, and he immediately expired under their strokes. The conquerors were then in no little perplexity how to get rid of the carcass, and a council was instantly held upon that occasion. Chevalier? And your lordship, without doubt, understood all their debates. Count. From first to last. The most experienced sages among them reasoned in this manner, to drag the carcass out by main strength, is an impossibility, the mass is by much too unwieldy, and beside, the body is fixed, to the floor of the hive by its own glue, and to leave it where it lies, would be very inconvenient, because it would prove an alluring regale to the common flies, and at the same time be liable to corruption and worms, and these worms, when they have devoured the snail, will infallibly ascend to the comb, and attack the young bees. The damage was evident, and required an immediate remedy, but you will hardly guess the dexterity with which they accomplished it. Chevalier, I should be glad to know your sentiments on the affair. How were they to conduct themselves on this occasion? Chevalier? So quick upon me, my lord. You are really very severe, to put the question to me, for it will appear that the bees had more presence of mind than myself. But pray, how did they proceed? Count. They encrusted the whole snail with glue, and cemented it so close, that all the external air was excluded, and as no infect could have access, to deposit her eggs in the carcass, so, when this should be reduced to corruption, no malignant steams would transpire through the enclosure. Chevalier? Will your lordship let me see the poor snail's tomb? Count. You shall have a sight of it today. It wants nothing but an epitaph. Chevalier? When the inside of the hive is well pitched, and the bees under shelter, how are the cells disposed? Prior. The foundation of the building is fastened to the top of the hive, there they lay a bed of glue, to which they fix the first cells of the comb, which they continue downwards, and enlarge them till they have no more room left. The comb is divided into three cantons, one where they rear their young, another, where they store their wax for their future occasions, and the third where they preserve their honey for the winter. I have nothing particular to acquaint you with about their young, the circumstances are pretty near the same as they are with the wasps. When the worm has left the egg, the mother constantly supplies it with honey, and at the expiration of ten or twelve days, when it has had its fill, an old bee comes and closes up the cell with wax. The worm in its retirement changes into a nymph, and the nymph becomes a bee, and after fifteen days repose, the young bee pierces through the waxen door, and when she has dried her wings, flies among the flowers, steals their sweets, and is perfectly acquainted with every necessary circumstance of her future conduct. As to the structure of the wax, the Count's observations have been more accurate than mine. Count. I confess it is a particular that has very much amused me. The wax is a provision altogether as necessary for them, in one sense, as the honey itself, they build their apartments with it, and it closes the cells of the nymphs, as well as those where the honey is treasured. When any accidents happen, any fractures open, or whenever the species grow too numerous, they recur to the wax, and therefore are always careful to provide a sufficient quantity in good time. They search for it upon all sorts of trees and plants, but especially the rocket, the single poppy, and generally all kinds of flowers. They amass it with their hair, with which their whole body is invested. Tis something pleasant to see them roll in the yellow dust that falls from the chives to the bottom of the flowers, and then return covered with the same grains, but their best method of gathering the wax, especially when it is not very plentiful, is to carry away all the little particles of it with their jaws and forefeet, to press and work them up into little pellets, and then slide them one at a time with their middle feet, into a socket or cavity that opens at their hinder feet. This cavity, is made to receive the wax, like a spoon, 
and the hair which covers their feet serves to keep the burden fixed and steady, till they return home. They are sometimes exposed to inconveniences in this work, by the motion of the air, and the delicate texture of the flowers that bend under their feet, and hinder them from packing up their booty, on which occasions they fix themselves on some steady place, where they press the wax into a mass, and wind it round their legs, making frequent returns to the flowers, and when they have stocked themselves with a sufficient quantity, they immediately repair to their habitation. Two men in the compass of a whole day, could not amass so much as two little balls of wax, and yet they are no more than the common burden of a single bee, and the produce of one journey. Those who are employed in collecting the wax from flowers, are assisted by their companions, who attend them at the door of the hive, ease them of their load at their arrival, brush their feet, and shake out the two balls of wax, upon which the others return to the fields to gather new treasures, whilst those who disburden them convey their charge to the magazine. However, I have seen some bees who, when they have brought their load home, have carried it themselves to a lodge, and there delivered it, laying hold of one end with their hinder feet, and with their middle feet sliding it out of the cavity that contained it, but this was evidently a work of supererogation, which they were not obliged to perform. The packets of wax continue a few moments in the lodge, till a set of officers come, who are charged with a third commission, which is to knead this wax with their feet, and spread it out into different sheets laid one upon another. This is the unwrought wax, which is easily distinguished to be the produce of different flowers, by the variety of colors that appear in each sheet. When they afterwards come to work it, they knead it over again, they purify and whiten it, and then reduce it to a uniform color. They use this wax with a wonderful frugality, for it is easy to observe, that the whole family is conducted by prudence, and all their actions regulated by good government. Everything is granted to necessity, but nothing to superfluity, not the least grain of wax is neglected, and if they waste it, they are frequently obliged to provide more, at those very times when they want to get their provision of honey. When they open the cells of honey, they take off the wax that closed them, and carry it to the magazine. You may likewise judge of their economy by another instance, when a young bee frees itself from its prison, by breaking down the partition of wax that shut it up, two old bees immediately present themselves, and carry away all the remains of this waxen partition, after which they immediately repair the ledge of the cell, and bear all the wax that is left to the repository. Thus you see nothing is lost. Countess? But is not this economy, my lord, much of a piece with your account of the deliberations about the snail? I am afraid all the ingenuity I admire in these proceedings, flows only from you. Count. I have sometimes, in a vein of pleasantry, supplied them with such kind of reasonings, but, in reality, the same wisdom that created these animals, has enabled them, for their preservation, to act as consistently as if they were influenced by reason itself, and as to the frugality I have been describing, tis what you yourself may be a spectator of whenever you please. Chevalier? Then as to the honey, my lord, will you be so good as to tell me what it is, and how they collect it? Count. The ancients believed honey to be an emanation of air, a dew that defended upon the flowers, as if it had a limited commission to fall only there. But it has been since discovered that dews and rains are very opposite to honey in their qualities, they wash it away, and prevent the bees from finding it. Honey is rather an efflux, or transpiration of the finest particles of the sapin plants, which evacuate through the pores, and afterwards condense on the flowers, and as these pores are more expanded in the warm sunshine, than at any other time, so you never see the flowers more replenished with a viscous and vermilion juice, nor the bees more transported with ardor and joy, than when the sun dispenses his brightest rays. I likewise take it for granted, that the season has proved favorable, because excessive rains either wash away the best salts from the soil, or injuriously dilute its purest juices, as on the other hand, the immoderate length of a dry season prevents those juices from flowing into the plant. Chevalier? Since we know what honey is, I should think we might go ourselves, and extract it from the flowers. Count. Yes, without doubt the thing is practicable. You only want an instrument for that purpose. Go to work, my dear Chevalier, and make a trunk, you remember I showed you a couple yesterday. Chevalier? I deserve to be rallied for my wise observation, I should rather indeed have asked your lordship, whether the bees content themselves with sucking the honey from the flowers, and conveying it home, or is it your opinion, 
that the juices of the flowers are converted into honey by the labors of the bees. Prior. For my part, I am apt to think the bee makes no alteration in the honey, but collects this delicious syrup as nature produces it, and first fills her bag, and then discharges it into the magazine. Count. I am of your opinion in that particular, and could never observe they were able to condense the honey, when it was too liquid, as Virgil affirms. Perhaps it may be true, that when they receive it into their body, they purify, and give it some consistence. But all I have remarked on the article of honey amounts to no more than this, they suck it up with their trunk, and empty it into the cells appropriated to receive it, and when they are all full, the bees close up some with wax, till they have occasion for the honey, the rest they leave open, and all the members of the society resort there, and take their repast with a very edifying moderation. Chevalier? The bees certainly act with more regularity than ourselves. Prior. The hive is a school to which numbers of people ought to be sent, prudence, industry, and benevolence, public spiritedness, and diligence, economy, neatness, and temperance, are all visible among the bees, or rather, let us say, they read as lectures upon them. Count. What most affects me, in these little animals, is to see them actuated by that social spirit which forms them into a body politic, intimately united, and perfectly happy. Look on a swarm of bees, and observe the disposition that influences every individual. They all labor for the general advantage, they are all submissive to the laws and regulations of the community, no particular interest, no distinctions but those that nature, or the necessities of their young, have introduced among them. We never see them dissatisfied with their condition, or inclinable to abandon the hive, in disgust to find themselves slaves, or necessitous. On the contrary, they think themselves in perfect freedom, and perfect affluence, and such indeed is their real condition, they are free, because they only depend on the laws, they are happy, because the concourse of their several labors inevitably produces an abundance that constitutes the riches of each individual. Let us compare human societies with this, and they will appear altogether monstrous. Necessity, reason, and philosophy, have established them under the commendable pretense of mutual aids and benefits, but a spirit of selfishness destroys all, and one half of mankind, to load themselves with superfluities, leave the other destitute of common necessaries. Prior. As long as men are not conducted by the Spirit of God, they are certainly the most unjust and corrupt of all animals. Count. I cannot express my indignation, when I see to what prostitutions our species degrade themselves, especially when they are possessed with the fury of ambition, and determined to live at ease, without giving themselves the least pain, to fee their fellow creatures barely possessed of food and raiment. But let us close this disagreeable scene, and though we find our manners condemned by the practice of these little animals, who officiate with so much tranquility and union, yet let us go on to make them the subject of our examinations, tis an article that infinitely delights me. I have seen, at the prior's house, a glass hive, wherein, as he has told me more than once, he has had a swarm of wild bees. Pray, sir, favor us with some account of them. Prior. As I knew your lordship had made many observations on the common sort of bees, I thought it would be better for me to bestow some notice on those who are wild, in order to observe the difference. These creatures, that several people call drones, and hornets, are nothing near so industrious and frugal as the domestic bees. They are more negligent in their settlements, and their work is, in every particular, inferior to that of the others, but for all this, it has its beauty. The nest is composed of dried leaves mixed with wax. This nest, which they usually build in some cavity dug in the earth by a field mouse, is well vaulted, to preserve it from rains and the falling in of the earth. They worked in the same manner, when they were in my hive, as they would have done in the field. The principles of their architecture are invariable. The nest is all perforated with different holes, like a sponge, so that one may easily see all that passes within. Each hornet builds, with the wax, a little cell, about the size of a large pea, cut through the middle, and round and hollow like half an eggshell. From these different cells joined together, results a sort of cluster very agreeable to the eye. The females, whose number among the bees and wasps, appears to be very inconsiderable, lay their eggs in the open cells, when this is done, some other bees close them up with wax, after which they stand upon the covering, and are in a perpetual agitation, either to give warmth to the eggs, 
or at least to repel the cold from them. When the worms leave the eggs, they endeavor to break down the door of their lodge, the bees without assist them in rubbing the wax, and making it soft, and then comes a large bee, who devours all the waxen covering. Chevalier? What, does he live upon the wax? Prior? No, sir, but he melts it in his stomach, which is very hot, and then employs it elsewhere in some other work. The worms who are hatched fall into convulsions, which moisten them all over with sweat, and what then transpires through their body, forms a glue that gradually hardens, and becomes a little white skin, which immediately enfolds them. This is their state of nymphs, and they then look like so many grains fastened to one another, and which, all together, form a little cluster. After this, out of each nymph's shell proceeds a little bee, who begins to rub his eyes with his four paws. His wings that are still spread on his back, and moist grow dry in the air by degrees, and in the space of a quarter of an hour, he springs aloft, and immediately attempts to fly at a venture, with those of his own age, the young ones are, for some time, permitted to sport as they please, and all the little bees do nothing, for the three first days but flutter up and down, and interrupt the work of the larger infects who, at length, begin to be weary of these wanton liberties. In consequence of which they chastise the little offspring, and bring them down to the ground, upon which the young ones, after they have turned round a considerable time, as if they were intoxicated, begin to work in their turn, and carry earth to the nest, to sustain the sheets of wax that form the vault, this earth they cement and spread out with a backward motion of their bodies over it. The old ones work in wax, and the young only perform the functions of mason's servants. Chevalier? Have not the wild bees a king or queen as well as the domestic tribe? Prior. I have certainly seen amongst mine, and that very frequently, a large insect, much superior in size to the rest, and without wings or hair, it was as bare as a plucked fowl, and black as jet, or polished ebony. This king goes from time to time to survey the work, he enters into each particular cell, seems to take their dimensions, and examine whether the whole be finished with due symmetry, and proportion. Count. I am not certain, sir, whether you have sufficiently considered this circumstance, or not, and am very apt to suspect this monarch to be a queen, and that her visits to each cell only tend to deposit her eggs there. Prior. I readily confess my inaccuracy in this particular, and your lordship is much more exact and attentive than myself, in all your observations. But however, I will proceed in the account of what I think I have seen, and beg the favor of you to rectify whatever may lead the chevalier into a mistake. When this queen makes her appearance, all the bees who present themselves in her way, form a circle around her, they clap their wings and rife themselves on their four feet, and after several leaps and curvets, attend her throughout her progress, at the conclusion of which the queen retires, and all the rest return to their employment, but these wild insects are far from devoting themselves to labor, with the same vigor and affidavit which the common bees discover. In the morning, the young appear indolent, and are with great difficulty brought to apply themselves to their several functions, but, in order to ruse them, one of the largest of the band, every morning at half an hour past seven, extends one half of his body out of a cavity contrived for that purpose, and seated on the most elevated part of their city, there he claps his wings for the space of a quarter of an hour, and, with the noise, awakens all his people. This summons them to work, and is the drum that beats the signal for their march. And I have frequently obliged my fraternity to take notice of this kind of discipline, which exceedingly diverted them. There is likewise another, who keeps guard all day, and I have seen him acquit himself of his commission with a vigilance that astonished me. When I have struck the hive, a little harder than ordinary, the sentinel immediately quitted his box, and with an air of great uneasiness and emotion, mounted to the top of the vault, running here and there to discover what might occasion the alarm, and when he has satisfied himself that no danger or enemy was near, he returned to his former post. I have sometimes thrown a common bee into the hive, after I had plucked off one of his wings, but he was instantly seized by the sentinel, and laid dead upon the spot. Chevalier? This makes the account I have read in my Virgil, of the guard kept by bees, very credible. But what, sir, is the food of these wild bees? Prior. They eat a kind of honey, but then tis inferior in purity to that of the domestic bees, because they extract it from flowers which grow wild, and are impregnated with juice of a bitter flavor. Chevalier? Do they store up any provisions? Prior. 
just as the bees do, and, for that purpose, they employ the cells out of which the worms proceeded, these they fill with honey, and then close them up carefully with wax. They are burdened with a number of sluggards, and tis probably, against them that they use this precaution. Count. But in what instance, sir, did you discover their idleness? Prior. In this, when the reft of their companions have been employed in the fields, I have observed these roving at a small distance from the hive. They give themselves the air of working a little, and then return home and eat, without having done anything material. Count. Your being so much accustomed to see bad actions in others, makes you suspicious. But these sluggards you mention, seem to me to be the males, as there are such among the bees, and they are nourished for a season, in requital of their past service, but when winter comes on, they are probably, sent away to provide for themselves elsewhere. Prior. What your lordship says, appears very probable, and I see no reason why the wild bees should not, as well as the others, have their queen, their males, and likewise a whole people without distinction of sex. But this is a point that requires farther examination. Count. Let me beg the favor of you, sir, to proceed in your observations on what passed in your hive. All this is new to me. Prior. Ah, my lord. My observations are all at an end, for we met with a very great accident. Count. Pray what was that? Prior. Four days ago, our queen came out very early in the morning, and, all enfeebled with age, proceeded with a trembling march to the confines of her dominions. I saw her lie down behind a little eminence, and after she had languished a few moments. Chevalier? What happened? Prior. She breathed her last, and all the city was in desolation. The drum did not beat the signal that day, and nothing was to be seen but a general grief and dejection. Chevalier? The prior makes me sympathize in their affliction. But what might be the event? Prior. It was natural for great disorders to ensue in the state, the number of inhabitants since that time, has daily diminished, and they are continually removing in quest of a new settlement. The day before yesterday, there was a very fierce battle, and one animal, more enterprising than the rest, lost his head, I saw him run without it to the top of the vault, where he did not expire till this very day. All order was at an end, the morning signal was no more repeated, no sentinel made his appearance, and the regular labors were entirely discontinued. Chevalier? I am not at all concerned at the execution of the malefactor, for I think he makes a very entertaining figure. Prior. My insects are all disconcerted, and I believe very few of them are now left. If the Count will trust the Chevalier in my company, for an hour or two, I will show him the structure of the nest. Count. Do something more, if there are no stings to be feared, take out the nest, and send it to me, or rather, let us rein our pretensions to the Chevalier, it will contribute to the embellishment of his cabinet, and may be hung up with his wasp's nest. Countess? Gentlemen, you have not yet discharged all your province, we have had a good account from you of the industry of bees, but you have not been particular enough in the use we make of their labors, and I must ask the prior how far these are capable of being extended. Prior. When the seasons are not irregular, a hive of bees may be, every year, worth a pistole and more. If there should be two swarms, the profit will be double the next year, though you should destroy the first bees with sulfur, in order to take their wax and honey. They are never permitted to work above seven years, because they grow feeble, and their labors are exposed to the ravages of worms and moths, who in process of time, find out the secret of sliding into the skins with which the young bees hang their apartments. But I don't take upon me to give you a detail of the management of hives. This is what may be learned from any common gardener, and the country house of honest Leeborx is in the hands of all the world. Everyone likewise knows the various uses that are made, not only of virgin wax, as it comes from the hive, but of that sort too that has been first washed and then melted, and made white, by exposing it alternately to the dews and sunshine. With this wax they make, not only flambeaux, tapers, images, and a hundred other things that are well known, but they likewise employ it, with great success, in anatomical representations, that perfectly imitate nature, and preserve those who have no occasion to be deeply learned, from the horror they are apt to be inspired with at the sight of a carcass, or flesh in a state of putrefaction. 
The richest lands don't produce the best honey, there are some soils not very luxuriant, that afford fruits, fowls, and each variety of game, and generally all productions that have finer juices, and a more exalted flavor. And there the honey is exquisite. Such, for instance, is the land about Corbier, a few leagues from Narbonne, and great part of Champagne. The honey of these countries is in the best repute. There is one very peculiar circumstance observed in the cantons of Champagne, that lie contiguous to the rivers, and are richer than the rest, which is this, the bees make long excursions into the neighboring countries, and prefer the flowers they find in a dry and sterile soil, to those that grow in the very fields where these bees were reared. A gentleman who lives near the river Arnia, and whose company I enjoyed one day, in a journey from Chalons upon the Marne, to Charleville, furnished me with this observation. We were about a league and an half from his estate, which lies in the valley, on the edge of the lovely meadows of a tiny, as yet we saw nothing but heath, and could not discover any village for above a league in circumference. Do you take notice? said he, showing us a crop of buckwheat, that refreshed us with a very agreeable scent, do you take notice of my servants who are dispersed about the country and are all at work for me? But perceiving that we did not comprehend his meaning, this is the whole mystery, continued he, those bees, who are flying among the flowers, come hither from a distance of two or three leagues. We daily fee them forsake our gardens, and take their flight over the meadows, despising the oil and fertility of our valleys, in short, they continue their progress to the mountains and plains of Champagne, where they find lavender, thyme, sweet marjoram, buckwheat and several other plants very little cultivated, but of a most delicate sap. You will find bees all the way from hence to my estate, and some curious observers are persuaded they have seen them, thrice in one day, take a journey of a league and a half, or two leagues, to furnish their table to their palate. Countess? Chevalier, these gentlemen are at the expense of our conversations, but as poor as you and I may be, I think in point of honor, we should endeavor to furnish our proportion and bring each of us the history of some insect tomorrow. Chevalier? I have made my court to the prior, who has a magazine of curiosities, and purpose not to come with empty hands tomorrow. The end of the seventh dialogue.